Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to our event, Building a Sustainable Energy System for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and uh, we uh, at BII, I think, uh, as all of you here in the room, but those of you online uh, will be aware, we're uh, investing now to deliver on sustainable development. And a key part of that is how we can invest in uh, the energy transition in a way that is also consistent with net zero development pathways. And of course, as we know in Africa, many countries really lack uh, access to uh, affordable and commercial form of energy. And so uh, how do we reconcile the challenge for increasing energy demand with uh, decarbonizing economies? Uh, I, I mean, for those of you that know me, I've been, uh, I mean, my PhD was on this topic. I've been working on this since 1994, I guess. Um, so I'm extremely excited to be uh, moderating this event. Uh, I'm a big believer that the technologies uh, are already there for what we need to decarbonize economies, particularly in the energy sector. But there are a lot of barriers, particularly political economy barriers. Uh, which means the policy, regulatory and other institutional frameworks are not conducive to those new technologies. So uh, at the same time, I think we should also recognize some of the markets in which we invest don't even have a strong energy system. So there is, I think, and we'll hear, I'm delighted to hear from two excellent speakers on this, potential to avoid uh, going down a heavily carbon uh, intensive energy system before then transitioning. We talk a lot about energy transition uh, and often, particularly in big countries like South Africa and India, that's a transition out of coal into clean energy. But of course, in many countries in Africa, it's, it's not really a transition out of anything. It's uh, how to really transition into uh, clean energy that will really drive and underpin development of, uh, of communities and, uh, uh, and business in the uh, country. So um, I think it's a, an extremely topical uh, subject. And for those of you, uh, some of you will probably be aware of uh, both of our speakers, uh, Lord Adair Turner, who is currently chair of the Energy Transitions Commission, which was established, uh, I think, what, three or four years ago, I think. Um, so I should read my notes on that. Oh, wow, that long. Gosh. And um, and that has been doing uh, some, I mean, amazing work, uh, including in India. And actually, I, I know Ajay Matur pretty well, who's been um, involved in that in India, um, but uh, has only just recently this year or last year started to look at uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which is, you know, excellent news for us. Um, and uh, and looking at uh, what the energy transition looks like, what are some of the challenges to drive that? Uh, I won't obviously steal your thunder, and obviously we'll have a lot of time to uh, ask questions as well uh, after Lord Turner's uh, presentation. And just as brief background, Lord Turner's been uh, some very senior roles. I think I remember you from when you were actually chair of Director General of the CBI, Confederation of British Industry. And 95 to 2000 and uh, and I remember thinking it was great to have someone who was actually championing a climate agenda in those days that was incredibly novel actually uh, to have someone in that position doing so uh, and many other uh, very uh, key roles including being the first chair of the climate change committee um, the independent body advising the UK government uh, and has various business roles at McKinsey Merrill Lynch uh, uh, and uh, non-exec director at Standard Charter amongst others. Uh, and also very many academic uh, uh, affiliations at the moment. Um, and then also Rose Matiso, who is research director of the Energy for Growth Hub, uh, which some of you will be aware. Uh, I know Paddy uh, has been doing some work with, with them uh, and they look very much at uh, Africa's energy needs in particular. And Rose has been doing uh, some really, really interesting research around net zero modeling electric vehicles uh, and emerging energy technologies. So I think the perfect person to join um, Lord Turner on this panel uh, as we unpack these issues. And prior to that, you were at the um, US Department of Energy where you led engagement on technology and policy dimensions of uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. 
so uh, bring a very uh, unique perspective in that respect as well. Uh, and have also served as a policy fellow in the office of US Senator uh, Christopher Coons, where you were leading and authored several key pieces of legislation uh, on uh, climate uh, under the Obama uh, legis un under the Obama administration and also CEO of the Moazo Institute, which supports the next generation of female scholars and thought leaders in East Africa. So um, I'd like to welcome both of our speakers. Uh, and uh, I'm personally extremely excited by this uh, discussion. Uh, it's incredibly topical and it's, uh, it's excellent that this research uh, is now being undertaken for the markets that we care so passionately about uh, and are working to uh, enable a sustainable energy transition for all. So uh, Lord Turner, please. Well, thank you very much. And it's great pleasure to be uh, here. Um, just a word on the Energy Transition Commission. So because it's important to understand uh, where we're coming from, but also I'll then explain why there are two logos on this presentation, us and WRI. The, the Energy Transition Commission has been going for six years now, six and a half. I, uh, somebody persuaded me to be the chairman and said it would take about four days a month and maybe I'd do it for two years. It takes about, you know, 30 days a month and six and a half years later, I'm still doing it. But that's because I think it's a useful thing to do. Um, we are a coalition of about 55 members a uh, primarily major corporates uh, from across the world. They include oil and gas companies like BP and Shell, uh, major electricity companies like Iberdrola, National Grid, SSE, Vattenfall, uh, major uh, industrial companies like uh, ArcelorMittal, Tata, et cetera. You can see on our website uh, who we are. Uh, we are active in China. We're active in India. We're active in Europe. And we are basically involved with trying to work out how to get the world to a net zero economy by mid-century in order to limit global warming, hopefully to 1.5, but certainly uh, if we can't do that to as little as possible uh, there are, uh, above that. We have developed you know, very clear and in a sense somewhat optimistic technological views as to what is possible both in the electricity system and in what are sometimes called the hard to abate sectors of the economy, steel, cement, chemicals, aviation, uh, shipping. Up until this year, we had done no work in Africa. We had done very detailed work, I'll talk about it a little later, modeling the Indian power system. We had done a lot of work on the global steel industry, the global aviation industry. We spent a lot of time with a, a European companies on how to decarbonize our power systems faster, but we hadn't done Africa. And we were aware of an argument, it's an obvious argument, that people say uh, we will need to, uh, that Africa has an opportunity to skip a generation and never build a, a fossil fuel system uh, to start with. But there are other people, and I heard this phrase in South Africa, in, sorry, in Saudi Arabia last week, who said that Africa will have to carbonize before it decarbonizes. I, that's what uh, the rich developed countries do. So it's obvious that Africa will have to do the same. So we were very keen to take our understanding of the technologies and the investments and the companies of the world and the financial institutions and to work out uh, what of our overall vision was and was not applicable in Africa. We are working closely with the World Resources uh, Institute. Most of these uh, presentations that I am making, I'm doing uh, jointly with Dr. Rebecca Shirley uh, of the World Resources Institute based in uh, Nairobi. It is very much a joint uh, effort, but she's unable uh, to be with us uh, for this event, but we will be jointly together at Sharm El Sheikh in, in a lot of different presentations. Uh, one final thing to say about we are focusing on sub-Saharan Africa and sub-Saharan Africa excluding South Africa. And there's a reason for that. There really is very different challenges in Africa between North Africa, which already has in many cases in Algeria and Libya, very significant developed oil and gas uh, resources. South Africa, which has a large coal system and has got to work out how to transition out of it, the sub-Saharan Africa excluding uh, South Africa uh, is very different. And it is very different uh, in one particular feature, which is that the, hopefully this is gonna work. Is this gonna work? Am I pointing at the right thing? Will somebody tell me? Uh, 
Oh, there we go. It is very different in that the total amount of current energy use is absolutely trivial. And it really is extraordinary when you work out how trivial it is. Actually, it's not trivial in one sense. The use of traditional biomass for cooking is significant. But outside of that, whenever you think about what you might call modern energy, either from fossil fuels or in the form of electricity, we are at very trivial amounts. So I think you can see on the chart, you get, this is electricity generation per capita uh, and use per capita. Average American uses about 13,000 kilowatt hours per year, 13 megawatt hours per year. Uh, in Europe, we're a bit more efficient at about 6,000 kilowatt hours a year. South Africa is significant at 4,000. India is about 1,000. And there's sub-Saharan Africa at a level of less than 20% of India. This is really a very trivial level of starting point. And that has one very clear implication that in sub-Saharan Africa, we are not talking about a transition away from the existing energy system because there hardly is an energy system. And at one level, that's the whole proposition. Can we move beyond it quickly? We are talking about how do you develop an energy system that doesn't yet exist on the sort of scale capable of supporting, first of all, a lower middle income level, and then hopefully a middle and then an upper middle income level, hopefully over the next uh, several uh, decades. So this is not about all the challenges that we get in Indonesia, or Ind India, South Africa, how are we going to get rid of existing coal? Uh, this is about building a system uh, in the first place. There are out there, I would say, two schools of thought. I mean, they're not, I mean, everybody is a bit nuanced, but I'm afraid they are in danger of getting very uh, a, a opposed at the moment, and, and, and it's getting quite fraught. There is, on the one hand, the people who say Africa can clearly skip a generation and go straight to renewables, build big power systems uh, without having any fossil fuels. And then there is the other side of the argument that says Africa has to develop its oil and gas and must be allowed to develop its oil and gas. President Macky Sall of Senegal said recently, we will need to develop our gas in order to provide 600 million Africans with energy access, electricity access that they don't have uh, at the moment. So that very polarized debate, and I think we will hear a lot about it uh, in uh, Sharm El Sheikh at COP27, is part of the background of, of our, our, our work. And we are trying to step through that debate in a dispassionate and granular fashion, getting away from some of the top level rhetoric. One starting point is a very simple point that Africa has unbelievable amounts of renewable resource uh, in uh, principle. So the ETC, the Energy Transition Commission, we have been absolutely at the most aggressive edge of how much electricity the world needs. We believe that the future is electric, that even in rich developed countries like Europe, we will double or three times our electricity consumption. We will take electricity consumption from 25% of final energy demand to 60%, and then we'll use electricity and hydrogen. And as a result, we generate beliefs that from 27,000 terawatt hours electricity in the world today, we could go up to 100 or 120,000 terawatt hours of electricity being used by mid-century. The IEA estimates that the total renewable energy resource in Africa from solar and wind is, as you can see, add those two together, about 1.6 million terawatt hours. So it is over 10 times, it's about, uh, uh, sorry, 2.6, it's about 19 times bigger than even our most aggressive estimates of all the electricity needed for the whole world. So one has to realize you start with this just enormous amount of physical uh, potential. The question then is, and there are four questions I'm gonna talk about. One, is it true that Africa could develop renew uh, electricity systems which are primarily renewable to start with? How much fossil fuel does it need for the electricity system? Two, and I'll go slightly quickly over this, how are we going to deal with the chicken and egg of African electricity demand, which is you start with people too poor to buy much electricity. So how do you get the demand in place 
to deliver the supply. Three, whatever is the requirement for fossil fuels in electricity, do we need it elsewhere in the economy for transportation, for industrialization, uh, for home cooking? And four, what about the export opportunity? Even if Africa does not need all that much oil and gas for domestic development, does it need it, should it develop it in order to have export revenue? So those are the four questions that they're going to ask. The first on the power system, I think one should break down into two questions. One, what is the cheapest way in Africa to produce a kilowatt hour of electricity? Now, of course, it'll vary country by country, but in general, what can one say about that? And then two, a second question, can you actually build systems total systems which have high levels of variable renewables. They're two separate questions, because you could say the cheapest way to produce a kilowatt hour of electricity is solar, but also say, but I can't have more than 40% of my electricity coming from solar because it's intermittent. So those two questions. On the first, I think it's very simple. The cheapest way to produce electricity in vast majority of sub-Saharan Africa should be from renewables, but that will only be the case if, but only if, we can reduce the cost of capital and unleash huge financing. So one of the key features of the world over the last 15 years has been this remarkable fall in the cost of uh, the estimated cost of wind, solar, uh, offshore wind, onshore wind. The most dramatic is solar PV down in price by about 90% over the last 10 years. And these are what are called levelized cost estimates. When you look at some of the auctions that are being bid, they're even lower still. Last year in Saudi Arabia, Aquapower bid in and won a project to deliver electricity at $10.4 per megawatt hour, one cent a kilowatt hour. And there are many parts of the world, the most favorable parts of the world, Western Australia, uh, Chile, uh, bits of Northern India, where you can now clearly go out and develop solar at two cents a, a, a kilowatt hour. On the basis of that, the IEA says that at least by 2030, if not before, the cheapest way to produce a kilowatt hour of electricity in Africa, in most of sub-Saharan Africa, will be solar. It will be cheaper than gas. It will be cheaper uh, than coal and wind will be getting competitive as well. The crucial point, however, is that the levelized cost and therefore the price to delivery of solar and wind depends crucially on the cost of capital and the cost of capital of those is much more, the cost of those is much more sensitive to the cost of capital than is fossil fuel development. It's a very simple insight. When you build renewables, you put a wind turbine in the ground or a solar panel on the ground, you have capital costs to invest, you have close to zero marginal cost of operation. So everything is about the physical capital cost of those panels and the cost of capital, the rate of return which is required. And the levelized cost and the price that you can deliver at is heavily sensitive to the cost of capital and much more sensitive than the cost of doing a fossil fuel project where there is upfront capital investment, but there is also significant operating cost over time. As a result, there is a cost of capital at which solar and wind in Africa will be way less expensive than fossil fuels, but there is another cost of capital where they will be more expensive. And the fundamental problem that we see in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, is as follows. If you look on the dotted line across this chart, you can see the weighted average cost of capitals that two different modelers, IRENA and IEA, assumed when they were producing their estimates that I showed you on the previous page of levelized costs. So the IEA was assuming, let me do that on the basis of working out a 7% weighted average cost of capital. But then look at the dots. I mean, this is just somebody's analysis, but broadly speaking, directionally, it's correct. The dots, the non the empty circle dots are the world outside Africa, and these very low ones down here will be rich developed countries with low costs of capital, and the black dots over to the left are the uh, situation in much of Africa, including sub-Saharan Africa. There are some countries of sub-Saharan Africa where the cost of capital available to people to develop is just so high that it undermines the fundamental proposition 
that solar and wind should be able to be cheaper. From which we simply reach a very simple conclusion that solar and wind should be the cheapest, will be the cheapest, but if, but only if, we can get large financial flows at adequately low cost of capital. And the hugely important issue, therefore, is what is going to be required to unleash those large financial flows. And uh, there's a report going on joint by Nick Stern and Vera Songwe, which will be launched at COP27 about what is required to overcome some of the barriers on this page, barriers to adequate finance at low cost of capital. You have to think about foreign capital investment. One of the problems with foreign capital investment is that investors starting in a foreign currency country want to invest in projects which have a foreign currency revenue stream attached to it. Now, if you develop oil and gas, you can invest in dollars, you'll get a dollar revenue stream. But if you're investing in renewables for domestic consumption, and you start with a foreign currency, you're investing in foreign currency for a local currency revenue stream. That is a challenge. It is also a very major challenge. And here I would say the situation in sub-Saharan Africa is totally different from the situation in India. If you go to India and you talk to somebody like Mukesh Ambani, the head of Reliance, a man personally worth over 100 billion with a company worth many times that, and enormous corporate cash flows, in a market with a large capital market, large equity markets, et cetera. He doesn't have a problem about the cost of capital. And he is making commitments to say that he will make India the cheapest place in the world to produce green hydrogen uh, by 2030. Uh, and he has the capacity to do that. Broadly speaking, in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, we do not have individuals or companies or ca low domestic capital markets remotely like that. So that is a crucial point and the essence of our point on the levelized cost. The second question is, how big can variable renewables be as percent of an electricity system? When I was the first chair of the UK Climate Change Committee back in 2008, I'd have probably told you 50%, and that we should then get 20% of our electricity from nuclear, but 30% from some form of thermal dispatchable plant and add CCS to it. But when the facts change, I changed my mind. And over the last 10 years, that collapse in the cost of renewables has changed it. And across the developed world now, we have many people setting out scenarios in which they envision that variable renewables, either wind or solar, could account for as much as 70, 80, and some people would say even 90% of an energy system. I was in Spain yesterday meeting at a senior level with the Spanish government, and they, by 2030, and I think they will definitely be there, will have 74% of their electricity coming from wind and solar, right? 74%. So this appears to be absolutely uh, doable. One of the implications is that we've all got to stop talking about baseload. Right. And there is a confusion in this debate where people say, I need oil and gas for baseload. Right. Baseload meant systems where you had some plants that ran all the time and then others which flexed on and off to meet variable demand. The future system is one where we have varying demand still along the top line, but we have hugely varying renewable supply. And what you need is not baseload, you need flexibility. You need something that can switch on and off in inverse proportion to how much wind and solar you've got. The crucial issue is how much, how much is needed and how much is cost effective. I think in rich developed countries, if you look in the UK, the modeling done by SSE and National Grid, the need for that thermal dispatchable plant may be as low as 15% of total uh, generation. And we, from some work we did in uh, India, are convinced that that can be also economic. We believe that even with today's technologies, which is the red line, the lowest cost total system cost would be about 60% renewables, but that that point of optimality, the lowest point on the curve, could be as high as 80% by 2050 with the fall that we are going to see in the cost of renewables. So we are clear that in most countries in the world, we should be setting out to develop uh, systems which are 
say 70 or 80 percent variable renewables with thermal dispatchable plant, the thing that balances the system, and then that thermal dispatchable plant eventually becoming zero carbon, either because you add CCS to it or you switch it to hydrogen combustion rather than gas consumption, which to us implies that what one should be taught thinking about in these sub-Saharan Africa systems is building as much renewables as possible. There's very little of it at the moment with natural gas, which starts at say 25% or so of the system actually shrinking uh, over time uh, to be no more than 10% by 2050. But this is where one has to get into the real debate, right? I don't think there's a, does Africa need gas or not? The issue is, does it need it in large quantities on base load with the vision that it might for a long time be 30 or 40 percent or 50 percent of the system or does it need it as flexibility at 10 or 15 percent because that makes a lot of difference to how important you think oil and gas developments are but we need to break down the question to that level uh, of detail and in order to do that and it's a point we make in our report we need to get to an extra level of granularity you can take this argument so far by analogy to what's happening in Spain or India, by pointing out the technological possibilities. But to actually work out how it's going to work in an individual country, you've got to do it in an individual country. You've got to say, where is the wind? Where is the solar? What is the balance of wind and solar? How many hours per year will I probably be producing electricity? What are likely to be my demand profiles? How do I actually do it? And that is our next step, we hope, to go on to that level of granularity, but with the hypothesis that there's no fundamental reason why sub-Saharan African countries shouldn't be the same as you know, Spain or India and shouldn't be able to build those systems which are sort of 70 or 80%. I'm gonna deal very quickly with the issue of the chicken and egg, but I can sum it up on uh, this chart. If you simply have, if you extend the grid to somebody who can only you know, spend you know, a few dollars a year or even 10 or $20 a year and a very low level of consumption uh, just to run some light bulbs and maybe a, a very low watt uh, refrigerator, it just isn't an economic proposition for the utilities to do that. At the other end, if you can get serious size commercial and industrial companies, you will get a faster payback. We, and I'm gonna say no more than this, we think it's incredibly important to extend electricity access to as many African people as possible as a reason of social inclusion, but we do not think that that is gonna be the big driver of energy demand, which therefore makes it economic to finance the grids and uh, to finance significant scale of generation. Let me turn to what about um, no, the non-electric uses. You get in this debate an argument that says Africa must industrialize, Africa needs oil and gas for industrialization. Again, what we have tried to do is break this argument down into granular elements, different sectors of industry, different applications. And if I can just sum up uh, to go through it quickly, what do we believe? There is an issue about household cooking. The vast majority of people in sub-Saharan Africa at present use traditional biomass. This sometimes means charcoal. In some cases, it simply means, you know, wood picked up from uh, the local trees, uh, et cetera, burnt in incredibly inefficient stoves, uh, which, you know, have a terrible uh, a conversion of primary energy into actually usable heat with terrible health impacts and terrible emissions. Everybody agrees we've got to get out of that. Can we move rapidly to electrification? We doubt it. This is one where we do think there is a very major role for liquid petroleum gas, bottled gas, uh, LPG, in driving that first stage. That has a lot to do with the, the, the nature of cooking. I hadn't realized about this till I thought about it. If you want to run light bulbs, or if you want to run a refrigerator, you only need a small amount of wattage to, to do that, right? You only need a small amount of power. So you only need to that village quite a small grid connection, or you can do it off rooftop solar. The nature of cooking is you've got to, you've got to produce a 
a surge of several kilowatts to do cooking. It is also turns out to be it's probably more expensive than LPG. So we put LPG as, yes, those people who say we need LPG in the initial stages to get people off traditional biomass, broadly speaking, yes. On road transport, Africa's electrification will happen, but it will be delayed. All electrifications, you've got to think about a flow stock model. By 2035, every single new car being bought in Europe will be electric because we've got that regulation now in place. But it'll take 10 years before every car on the road is electric because you've just got a turnover issue. That turnover will be slower in sub-Saharan Africa because about 80% of cars in sub-Saharan Africa are bought secondhand from Europe. They are secondhand. And Africa will probably be buying secondhand internal combustion engines, even at the point where Europe is only buying uh, EVs. Now, we think that there will be a point where Africa go, will go through an accelerated transition because by 2045, there will be secondhand EVs and they will be much better EVs than today's EVs with you know, a better range, et cetera. But up to 2040, we could see increasing demand for oil for transport. In industry, cement, we think there probably should and will be a role for gas in cement uh, because cement, in order to decarbonize, you have to use carbon capture and storage because the very chemical process of producing cement produces CO2, whatever your energy source. And because that is going to be the route to the decarbonization of cement, that is probably a industry which will still be using fossil fuels even in 2050. But when we get to steel and fertilizers, we think it's possible that many African countries should be thinking about skipping a generation. Five years ago, I hadn't even heard of making steel from hydrogen. This is 100 grams of zero carbon steel made with hydrogen direct reduction at SSAB's pilot plant at Lulea uh, in northern uh, Sweden. The possibility of moving way beyond, way away from coking coal based, based steel, so iron, we're talking iron making here really, uh, away from coking coal, not just to gas, but all the way to hydrogen is looking far more possible now. And I think we think there are many African countries, if they're going to get into iron making, and let's be clear, almost no iron making occurs in sub-Saharan Africa today, should think very seriously about whether they want to base it on gas or whether they want to skip a generation to steel. And similarly, fertilizer. Uh, Africa should use more fertilizer. It should make fertilizers domestically rather than import it, which it primarily does. That can be done with gas, but it can also be done with zero carbon uh, hydrogen. So what we're trying to do in the industrial sectors is get beyond this blanket, does Africa need gas for industrialization, yes or no, to say you can only think about that sector by sector and try to get a more granular result. Finally, the issue of exports, the development of African oil and gas in order to export it and get export revenues. There is here a climate justice argument being put forward. And it is an argument that says, you in the rich developed world, you develop your oil and gas, you got economic benefit to it. And some of you are now telling us we should not develop our oil and gas, well, but we could get export a, a revenues from it. It's a climate justice argument, and it's one that I entirely accept. I do not think we can tell African countries that they should not develop oil and gas if we are still developing oil and gas in the North Sea. Now, let me make it plain. I do not think we should develop any more oil and gas in the North Sea. I would rather that we both didn't develop more oil and gas. But I think there is a problem with the initial IEA position on this that came out last year, which said no new oil and gas developments, but it's OK to invest more to squeeze more out of existing oil and gas fields in rich developed countries, because that's where they exist. You can see from the point of view of many African political leaders, that is not just. There is a role for African oil and gas export. But that role must sensibly think about what is going to happen to oil and gas demand globally 
over the next uh, 30 years. And if we are serious about climate change, if we are serious about climate change, it's going to have to be on one of these lower lines, the green line, the red line, or the blue line, and not what's called the IEA announced pledges line. If we're going to have any chance of limiting global warming, we are going to have to see reductions in total global natural gas use of maybe 60% by 2050, oil use by 75%. And actually, over the last year, I'm more confident that that's going to occur. I'll stick my neck out. Europe will be using much less gas by 2030 than was a reasonable expectation only 10 months ago, right? Because we are accelerating progress to get rid of it. We will probably be, in, well, we will be importing more of that in LNG. So the opportunity for Africa is uh, increased share of a smalling amount, but it is eventually a small amount. And what one then has to think about is in an environment where the world only needs a certain amount of oil and gas, where are African producers going to be on the cost curve? And what you have here is estimates from uh, trusted people who do this analysis. I think this is from Reichstadt Energy of the cost of producing in 2040 um, an increasing number of barrels of oil a day. You put as a sort of vertical slice down how much demand will you think would, would there will be? Let's take the IEA net zero. It would be uh, 40 million barrels of oil a day. If it's 40 million barrels of oil a day, you could deliver that out of already existing sanctioned projects without building any new oil and gas in the world. If you think it's 65 billion barrels of oil a day, the cheapest place to produce that is going to be US shale or Saudi and Iraq. It's not going to be Africa. Let's be clear. I was in Saudi Arabia last week. The Saudis are very, very relaxed about a world of 25 million barrels of oil a day because it is absolutely economically logical that when we produce 25 million barrels of oil a day, about 12 million of those will probably be in Saudi because they're the cheapest place to produce it. Africa will not be the cheapest place to produce it. So although we see a role for exports, we would say that Africa will be well advised to think about not such big investments that they are left with stranded assets in the future and well advised to think about the alternative resource that they are sitting on, which is green hydrogen. Again, this is one of these extraordinary figures, this disconnect between resources and ambition. The IEA estimates that within 200 kilometers of the coast, Africa will be able by 2050 to produce over 5,000 million tons of green hydrogen at a cost below $2 a kilogram. Now, to give you an idea, again, the ETC is very aggressive when we make forecasts about future technologies. We think that hydrogen could go from 100 million tons today across the world to somewhere between 500 and 800 by 2050. But this is 5,000 million tons could be produced. So you sit there with 5,000 million tons could be produced, and the IEA's aim for 2030, their forecast is that Africa might produce 4 million tons. We keep on ha having this extraordinary disconnect between the enormous potential resources uh, and what is planned. We think it likely that African countries in total, but then I'm going to put a caveat onto that, should think about a changing balance of opportunity over time, illustrated by this chart. An opportunity in the reds and the mauve and the brown, which is fossil fuel exports, which will decline over time, and an opportunity to export green hydrogen or the derivatives of green hydrogen and the minerals to support global decarbonization, which is the green and the blue uh, bars to the right, which will increase over time. And that will be a bigger opportunity. Now, of course, the difficulty with this analysis is sub-Saharan Africa is not one country, some of them have a lot of oil and gas. Others have a lot of green hydrogen potential. So if this was one country, uh, this analysis would be absolutely compelling. To go to the next stage, you have to think about how this works for Mozambique, which has oil and gas. How does it work for Namibia, which doesn't have oil and gas, but is drenched in sunshine and will probably be end up as one of the cheapest places in the world to produce green hydrogen. So in sum, do we need fossil fuels for the power system? Yes, to some extent, but probably less 
than most people are suggesting because there is quite an opportunity to go absolutely straight towards the eventual system, which is renewable based. Do is, is it needed in non-electricity? Yes, in LPG. Yes, oil for a time in transportation. Yes, in cement. But we're not sure that it is for some aspects of other industrialization. And as for exports, yes, African countries should be allowed to develop oil and gas for exports, but they would be well advised to think about how big the demand for, will, for that will be in an environment where total global oil and gas demand will begin to decline and where there are other places in the world which will be cheaper places to produce it. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lord Turner. So much there that, um, to digest. I have to say, I, I particularly lost that la the last bit of analysis because actually in my previous role, we did some work with UCL, uh, Professor Paul Leakin's team oh, yeah. on unburnable carbon, unburnable oil, and actually came up looking at Latin America uh, oil and came to the conclusion that in 1.5 degree scenario or world, only Middle East oil was competitive. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we, uh, I mean, US shale gas probably had US shale gas on. is distressingly cheap, <laughs> I, 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 I would say. <laughs> this was about five years ago we yeah. started, so yeah. probably it wasn't quite as cheap yeah. then. Right. But yeah, that, that was uh, really eye-opening. Um, so, uh, well, I'm now delighted to uh, ask you, Rose, uh, to make some reflections. But before I do, it'd be great if you could tell us a bit more about your work at the Energy for Growth Hub. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Rose Matisso and I'm with the Energy for Growth Hub. We are um, a think tank based in Washington, DC. We have a very small core team, mostly in DC. Uh, I'm here in London and we have other team members in Africa. Um, but then what is interesting about our model is that we are mostly comprised of a non-residential network of fellows at universities and institutions all over the world. So for example, Rebecca Shirley no. is one of our fellows and a good friend. Okay. Um, I used when I lived in Nairobi, uh, we, were, we, we worked a lot together. Um, and so our mission is, you know, we imagine a world uh, echoing your presentation in which we have this high energy future for Africans, uh, really raise ambition, think beyond SDG seven level household, and really power economic growth. And our kind of mechanism is to work with researchers to translate evidence into actionable policy um, proposals and connect with policymakers um, and DFIs and investors um, and other kind of practitioners in the space. Uh, we cover all sorts of stuff, like for example, some of our work is around um, unlocking market bottlenecks. And so we do some work around contract transparency um, and kind of what the best practices that governments can, can use and follow. Uh, we do some work around um, advanced technologies, uh, like the role of nuclear, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you know, what is possible, what is not, just adding some evidence around that. Um, I lead our work also on emerging technologies, uh, including hydrogen, um, electric vehicles in the African um, uh, continent. And um, yeah, and so we just really want to see more evidence in action around kind of adding specificity um, on energy development in Africa. Great, thank you. So what what do you think of Lord Turner's work? And uh, <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot here. <laughs> I was writing some notes. I, I, I generally agree. I was hoping for more sparring, but I think we're friends. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I generally agree. And so just a few, I mean, fantastic presentation. Um, I think uh, we need more clarifying conversations that are beyond the level of vague proclamations and really getting to the evidence. And I think this is what my colleagues and I work on too. So a few reflections. So I, I liked your point on this carbonize before decarbonize. And I, I also agree that this is kind of nonsense, um, maybe for both similar and different reasons. Uh, maybe where I would add a little bit of texture is because the energy system is as you said, there's, there's such a low baseline. I mean, some of my colleagues did some analysis that even if you tra you tripled natural gas yeah. power development on the continent, like this would translate like overnight. So this is like really ambitious, like unrealistic growth. This would translate to less than a percentage point of increase yeah. of emissions. Yeah. And so the idea of carbonizing 
is it, it doesn't even make sense. There's no way that you could carbonize in Africa on time scales that that makes sense that would be relevant. And so it's really helpful to think about the transition, like what is Africa doing now? Um, you know, what technologies can displace uh, like heavy fuel oil or dirtier uh, generation? Or, um, you know, how can we start laying the groundwork for transportation sectors to be cleaned up? And so, you know, slowly building that out, but that the future uh, destination is going to be sustainable, it's going to be green. Um, and so the, the carbonization question doesn't come into being uh, in terms of what Sub-Saharan Africa does now in the short term has such little bearing. And the ambition is definitely for low carbon development. Um, another, I loved your question about can Sub-Saharan Africa develop power systems that are primarily renewable to begin with? Um, yes, Kenya is, I think, 90% green. <laughs> and as you said, it's really a matter of resource endowment uh, in different countries. And so some countries already set up, Kenya, Mozambique, Ethiopia, already set up with the right resource mix that we are already more or less there. Um, the question is, as we grow demand, if we're assuming this ambitious growth trajectory, how do we plug that in and how do we build in variable you know how do we build a system that can accommodate variable renewables and this this is not just a question of the supply side uh, part of it is ecosystem so it's not just how much potential do we have on the continent for different renewable technologies but uh, it's not just a resource potential it's what is the ecosystem do our grids i, I think their colleagues here work on grid works can our grids absorb that do we have sophistication in our control do we have demand and I think this is a big problem in Africa is we just don't have demand. And this is where your, your uh, points on building local industries, productive capacity is important. Our utilities, there's no credible off taker. And so even if you put in a bunch of solar, you know, nobody, there's, there's, there are no contracts that can, you know, make those, those um, uh, deals viable. And so I think that we need to look beyond the supply side and not just building scenarios around what we can produce from a generation side, we have to think about the ecosystem that these renewables are plugging into and how we can support that. And also um, how we can have um, productive users, high energy uh, consumers uh, that are also you know, building demand and creating opportunity. Um, what did I say? So I, I liked your, uh, your point on hydrogen and uh, green minerals and this idea about export in general. And I just wanted to make uh, a point here that, you know, resource exports has never been a development pathway for Africa. I mean, we have countries that do all sorts of export yeah. and it has not led yeah. to anything. And so for me, yeah. there's a lot of de debate, but what is more useful, even as we think about hydrogen, even as we think about grid mineral minerals, is if we really care about building opportunity on the African continent is local use. And so as you make your investments, how can we have value addition on the continent? And so that we're not just shipping you know, bags of dirt with cobalt <laughs> embedded somewhere, you know, out, out of the continent. And so I think this applies to both uh, oil and gas, but also the new kind of green resources of the future is what would be important is local use more than an export frame. And I think that's one thing I've found quite disappointing about the hydrogen chat is it's all about export ambitions mm -hmm. as opposed to what can be built on the ground uh, that adds value, that builds opportunity and jobs. Um, so what else did I have to say? I think gas, in terms of the, the role of gas, I, I agree broadly again, uh, and I loved your, um, your chart about the different sectors. So I think L LPG, that's hugely important. Uh, I think many people don't appreciate the, you know, the social moral failure of people continuing to use traditional biomass mm -hmm. on the continent and then LPG is, I think, a really important pathway out and there'll be a use for that. Um, in terms of where gas to power uh, comes into play, I do think definitely, and my, ex and my colleagues agree, in the short term, there is a role for gas uh uh power in africa and there needs to be some investment investment around that again this is in the grand scheme so minute like you know if uh nigeria wants to build five gas power plants uh you know and a lot of this is maybe displacing um heavy fuel oil i mean this is nothing in the grand scheme and so i think i would encourage a lot of the observers and practitioners in the space to fret less about that that the the direction of travel is towards uh, a green sustainable uh, um, energy system, but what we should be worrying about is the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Do we have the grids in place? Do we have sophistication in grid operations? Do we have the demand? 
that is where the real meat is. The, the details of whether one plant is being built in Mozambique or not, that's a distraction. Um, and I think I'll stop there, but I'm sure there'll be more. Yeah, questions. thank you. And I think what's really interesting, and I think both of you in your own ways have highlighted that the debate has been dominated by these sort of two polar ends. And actually there is a very much a middle ground. Yep. And I think, I mean, I think certainly we at BI are in that middle ground in that we have the, a gas guidance tool that looks at many of these issues. So anyway, I'm delighted now, to, so uh, no need to introduce Nick. Uh, Nick O'Donoghue, our uh, Chief Executive Officer. Um, so as an investor, how do you, uh, what do you think here has resonated and how, you know, how does, what does that mean for us as, at BAI in terms of our approach to Africa? So thank you, Emily, and thank you. I want to thank uh, Rose and Lord Turner for being here and also, um, both of you for your leadership in this area, because I think it is really tremendously important. It's tremendously important for the world. It's tremendously important for Africa. And it's great that, uh, that the WRI are now focused on sub-Saharan Africa, because I think as you uh, correctly point out, you know, BII is an organization that's investing in, re in renewable energy in all the geographies in which we, we uh, uh, are active. Uh, but the issues in say India, are very different from the issues in South Africa and very different from the issues in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I think, a, let me give a couple of reactions. I mean, I think first of all, um, I will stop talking now about baseload <laughs> because, because I am indeed one of the people that has, has as in, in, in all of these discussions around renewable energy have highlighted this issue that there is a baseload challenge, but I will stop talking about baseload now and I will talk about flexible Absolutely. flexibility yeah. and flexible power. But I think Emily is exactly right to say, I mean, from our perspective at BII, it's not an either or. There's clearly a, a, a critical direction of travel towards, and there's a chance to be, uh, there, there, we don't need to, uh, to carbonize in the way that a developed countries carbonize and then uh, um, uh, uh, subsequently decarbonize. So Africa's on, a different, Africa's on a different pathway, but we can't be too polarized about the debate. There are certain circumstances and conditions where, uh, gas particularly will play an important role. And that's why we at, uh, at BII invested through Globalec in, uh, in the Tamani project to build 400 megawatts of, 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 uh, of uh, gas power in yep. Mozambique, a country that has 70, where 70% of people do not have access to reliable power. But that should be seen as the beginning of something uh, and not the beginning of a massive transformation of, or, or building of gas fired power, but, but uh, uh, sort of a, a foundation upon which you can build a pr principally renewable uh, um, power system. And that's why, in addition to Tamani, we're also investing in Kwamba, which is a, which is a renewable project. Um, let me just comment on the cost of capital issue, because it is a very interesting one. First of all, we would agree, certainly, that the cost, and I think many people miss this fact, that, that uh, uh, within a renewable energy project, cost of capital is a hugely important part of the overall expense of the project. And we'd estimate in many cases, certainly 30% thir uh, uh, um, of, the, uh, of the total cost. So, it's, so it's, uh, it's important. I guess when we look at the projects that we're involved in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, actually we su pretty surprisingly little debt premium. In other words, the the, our ability or a project's ability to, to uh, borrow in, if we take Malindi, which is a 50 megawatt uh, uh, a solar uh, a project that we uh, did in Kenya, which I think at the time was the largest uh, grid connected um, solar project, there we were bar, uh, the cost of debt was about 6%. That was not different, particularly different from, from um, uh, other countries in which we we're investing. What was significantly different is the cost of equity. And why is the cost of equity significantly different? It's for all the reasons that Rose said. It's because um, execution is really difficult. If you look at Melindy, it, I don't know how many trips I made to Nairobi to see ministers, to put documents in front of them, to say, could you please expedite this? When we actually had the plant built, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, um, uh, switched on effectively for, for a year. These type of things for equity investors, um, if that's the precedent they see, this is going to be, very, this is going to be uh, put them off. Um, transmission which Rose mentioned. Um, and we saw the Turkana project, for example, wind project yeah. in Lake Turkana, which again was unable to dispatch for a considerable period of time yeah. because there wasn't a transmission built. 
It's interesting in South Africa, different example, but the JetP program, the Just Energy Transition Partnership and Trans program in, in South Africa requires more capital for, trans for it's putting more capital towards transition than they are actually for, for, for generation. Yep. So this is, um, we through uh, Gridworks uh, recently announced at Chagam a project uh, to build new, two new substations in Uganda. That to me is a potentially very significant project, both because, particularly because it's the private sector. And I do see much more in Sub-Saharan Africa, governments willing to embrace the idea of, of um, private sector participation in, in transmission. And this Uganda project is particularly important in that respect. Um, so, so I think it is about, uh, you know, when we look at, at projects today, it is about how can, uh, um, particularly from an equity perspective, how, and this is sort of a two-way street because we can't just make a, make a wave a magic wand and make this make make this whole sort of regulatory uh, 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 situation um, uh, hugely easier. I mean, there is a two-way street where I think it's important to keep emphasizing to governments in in, in sub-Saharan Africa that they need consistent uh, a regulatory policy approval policy uh, in order to attract the capital uh, to support this green transition. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. So, um, I mean, you covered a lot of ground and maybe um, uh, Lord Tadda could just unpack yeah. a couple of a couple of uh, points you made. I mean, I think, I mean, and as Rose highlighted, I mean, this this issue of demand is really, yeah. really uh, seems to be key and something we probably don't focus on. And maybe I'll come back to that one in a little bit. But just in terms of uh, this, the system um, and in particular, you know, this issue of flexibility is incredibly yeah. interesting. Um, in terms of the system evolution, uh, you know, we, we and, and this is something we're looking at in South Africa as well, is, you know, this issue of dispatchability is, yeah. is clearly key. Uh, and we know that uh, battery storage isn't necessarily, you know, the solution to that. Um, I think what you're suggesting is you need flexible, dispatchable power from gas mm -hmm. but presumably there's also the need for more flexible storage beyond what yep. already yep. exists and I think I, I think we've sort of I mean we you know pump storage is very yep. you know we, we've had that for decades or, or longer than that but and batteries are obviously a big focus but I mean, there are other forms of storage as well. I mean, what what have you, are you saying? Okay. And, let me, let yeah. me comment to that. And I'd also very much like to focus on the resources for export versus domestic use yeah. thing. But okay. on, on this one, look, when you think about how you balance a system, um, which has a lot of variable renewables, basically stuff that produces when it feels like it, rather than when you want it, you know, solar and wind, you've got to think about a sort of time spectrum of things that you've got to fix. There's a, there's a literal second by second balancing voltage and frequency in the system, right? And most people who ran power plants 15 years ago had got very used to the idea that that is solved by what's called inertia, right? The inertia of turbines, heavy bits of metal, which are going round and round, and they naturally, uh, they respond to the voltage and frequency in the system. It is a known fact that we know how to fix that, right? And we know that because there are some entire days where we are ending up with renewables accounting for very close to 100% uh, of the system. Uh, you do not need large amounts of thermal uh, inertia system. There are modern ways of doing it. And by the way, that does include batteries. Batteries not doing serious energy shift, but batteries simply providing, you know, a, 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 an immediate response to, to balance your voltage uh, a, 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 and your frequency. Now, there may be complexities, and I think we hope in the next stage of this at particular country level to dive into the details of mm. how sophisticated does your grid management have to be to deal with it. But, but that is, that looks like a highly soluble problem uh, at, at a relatively low cost. You've then got to say, okay, how do I balance the system overnight, right? If I've got a whole load of solar, but I want to keep the, light right, the lights running into the evening and 
as incomes go up, the air conditioning running into the evening. That is the diurnal balance, day to night. And then you go all the way through to the seasonal balance, which is by far the biggest problem in Britain and Northwest Europe, which is we will build lots and lots of offshore wind in the North Sea, far more than we need to provide electricity in summer. And we will have some periods in February where we will get an anticyclone in the North Sea, where the wind will disappear for three weeks, and it will probably go inside with cold weather where there's a high winter heating peak demand. How are we going to deal with that? Now, one of the crucial things to realize is that that is a much more problem, a significant problem than the first. And indeed, broadly speaking, we think these balance problems will be easier in countries where, which are primarily solar and primarily have a diurnal balance problem. Mm. Those will be easier to solve than those where the balance problem is primarily um, seasonal and based on wind. We do think they are soluble in each case. I think the other thing to say is, when do these problems emerge? I remember uh, about five years ago, I, I was with the, uh, the, the top management team at 50 Hertz. 50 Hertz, a uh, well-named company, is one of the major grid operators. Uh, there's four major operators in Germany, and they, they follow, uh, they do the bit in Berlin and the whole of the old, what used to be the Eastern Lander uh, of Germany. And he said to me, the chief executive said to me, look, broadly speaking, we know that up to about 50 to 60 percent renewable generation, we're not going to have to do much fancy stuff, right? The system will just balance itself out with the thermal dispatchable plant that we've already got. Mm -hmm. The thermal dispatchable plant will just migrate over time from base load to flexibility, right? The more renewables we get, the more we'll start running our gas plants and even our coal plants only 30 percent and then only 20 percent of the year to balance against it you know 50 to 70 he said we're gonna have to do some work but we know how to do it 70 percent up we think we can do it but we've really got to do some more thinking about how you do it so some of these problems are further away if you look at sses a uh a very detailed analysis, which they've recently published on how to get to very close to net zero in the UK by 2035, below 30 grams per kilowatt hour. Up from really most of the way towards that, they're not putting in much battery storage or much else. What they're simply doing is switching the thermal dispatchable plant from base load to flexibility. Mm. But there does become a point where you do need to think about the storage devices. And we know there are a variety of storage possibilities. We think that for diurnal balance, batteries will be economic. I mean, fundamentally, batteries have high capital intensity. They're very efficient in terms of energy in to energy out. But because they're so expensive, they only make sense where you are cycling them a lot of the time, where you're using them 365 times a year to take some electricity in and take some electricity out. So although they're quite expensive per kilowatt hour storable, they're not all that expensive per kilowatt hour stored and discharged. You then get a set of intermediate options like pumped hydro, mm -hmm. um, like maybe what people talk about flow batteries, like liquid air, compressed mm -hmm. air, set of new yeah. technologies emerging there. And then at the longer term, our gut feel is that it will be hydrogen and that what we will do in the UK, but maybe also there in Africa as well, eventually is to say, I've got these gas turbines, which began running 50% of all the hours of the year. They're now running 10% of the hours of the year, but they're still producing some emissions. So now but in Africa, this is you know 2040 onwards, I want to go from low carbon to real zero carbon. I'm going to switch them to burning hydrogen. Yeah. Right. And the hydrogen can be burnt in gas turbines. It means the great news is you're not you're not throwing away those gas turbines you're building in Mozambique. And the one thing I would say, Nick, in your financing, keeping an eye on, are we making sure that technologically those gas turbines are capable of becoming hydrogen turbines? I think that's something that we should be aiming for. Yeah. That transition, I think, is doable. The crucial challenge there is the storage, right? The production of the hydrogen from electrolysis when we have surplus uh, a electricity is straightforward. The use by burning in a gas turbine is straightforward. 
And the challenge is to get down the cost mm -hmm. of hydrogen storage, whether it be in rock caverns and salt caverns in yeah. depleted gas fields, etc. Yeah. If I could just make one comment, I was really intrigued by uh, Rose's point uh, about, you know, should these hydrogen resources be for export or not? So what do we know from economic development across the world? One, we know that all successful catch up from low income to middle income and high income has been based on exports, but almost never on the exports of natural resources, right? So who are the successful catch up countries? They are the East Asian countries. They are Taiwan, China, Thailand, uh, you know, uh, 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 Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Korea. Every one of them had an export led model to get them going. None of them were relying on natural resources. And we know that there is a curse of natural resources, that natural resources tend to create political responses where people just grab over of the rents, you get uh, corruption. Uh, and also, you just export the natural resource, but you're not taking, you're not creating jobs and, and the value add. Mm. On the other hand, I don't think we should exclude the export model for natural resources in Africa, because there is this financing challenge. You know. Broadly speaking, if you want to import things like solar panels, either somebody's got to give you a gift or they've got to lend you some money, which is a foreign capital inflow, or you've got to have export revenues to pay for import revenues. That, that's you know, the macroeconomic balance. And although some of this can be foreign capital inflows, I think it will be quite difficult for many African countries to drive that development with the imported imports that they need to get going without significant export revenues mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they should exclude an export model. But to me, the crucial thing is to have as much value added as possible. Yeah. So yeah. what should African countries, any African country with iron ore and wind and solar should be planning to export iron, not iron ore, and not green hydrogen. It makes no sense for a country or a set of countries in, 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 in Africa, you know, where let's take Namibia and South Africa, there's, there's iron ore and there's hydrogen, makes no sense to send off the iron ore to the Ruhr Valley, mm. where there's iron making in the Ruhr Valley, because that's where the coking coal was in 1890, right? <laughs> and to combine it with hydrogen, ship from Namibia. This doesn't make any sense yeah. at all. So yeah. really thinking through what can you use green hydrogen for? To make iron, uh, to make ammonia, to make fertilizer, to go further and further down those value chains. Mm. And I think that is what a lot of these countries are already thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's really, really interesting. And actually, because I, when I was in South Africa earlier this year, the, there was a mining in Daba and you know, and I was asking why isn't South Africa actually processing more of uh, the mi minerals yep. here and exporting those as value add? I mean, uh, you know, various reasons. One, you know, that there is a sort of probably an incumbency there that uh, doesn't want to, yeah, uh, yep. you know, lose their export revenue in particular. Um, but I think another issue when we look at Egypt, it's very interesting when we look at uh, an investment that we're looking at with um, uh, Scatic Vertiglobe, um, that the Egyptian government have set up the Suez economic uh, zone mm -hmm. because they see Europe in particular is starting to introduce uh, or will likely introduce some form of carbon border tax yep. adjustment mechanism, which means uh, manufacturers in Europe are looking for ways of being able to produce their goods and products in a way that is zero carbon yep. so they don't get hit by the tax. So they're actually looking at setting up in an Egypt looking to attract the manufacturers, yep. bringing uh, the renewables and obviously, I mean, not just solar, but incredible wind resource. In Egypt. Every time I go, I, you forget how windy it is, actually, um, uh, and create this green corridor. I mean, for them, the transmission system is going to be key yep. to then have this economic zone. I mean, I think, you know, it's absolutely fascinating. They also have the Suez Canal. So from in terms of green bunkering, you know, could become incredibly, yeah. Yeah. you know. So I think that kind of export-led model is incredibly, um, I mean, the jobs created with that, the, you know, value add, uh, you know. And so we probably, all of us as well as DFIs, we need to be thinking, 
not just about the supply, but also the demand uh, and how we invest alongside that. And I know I mean, and Belinda here has been working on green manufacturing, actually. Maybe you'll be ready to ask a question when we get to that. So I think, you know, really, really fascinating. Um, and actually, um, so Rose, I wanted to, I mean, I also wanted to sort of ask a bit more about that because, I mean, how, uh, I mean, you mentioned green hydrogen, which is clearly part of it, but I, I do think the green minerals and uh, rare metals is also key, as we know, to the transition to net zero. Um, and, you know, I think at the same time, there's also a lot of challenges in that sector, often social challenges as well. But when we think about the social agenda, we also need to think about the just transition agenda, and that's becoming more and more prominent in in Africa, particularly in South Africa, under the JetP, um, how, in your experience, how can we bring in those voices into the planning and decision making processes that that we're talking about here? You know, what is what is the way we can enable that? Um, yeah, so I think when it comes to the the idea of the transition, also varies depending on you know which country you're looking at. So a country like South Africa, the transition looks quite similar to like a, a tradition in a traditional yep. sense. So like in Kentucky and, yep. Yep. you know, you know, there there's an incumbent industry uh, and a lot of people are going to be dispossessed and how do you move them forward? Yep. Uh, and the rest of, as you said, Sub-Saharan Africa minus South Africa, you know, it's such a green field yep. <laughs> setting. And, and so the idea of just transition looks quite different. It's just about development and, and, energy comes in because energy is central to development. And so from my perspective, and you know, I'm not an, uh, an activist, I'm not on the ground. I look at things uh, more from a macro sense, but you know, so from my perspective, I think the justness comes from just creating opportunity, uh, building energy systems that, you know, lead to jobs, <laughs> lead to opportunities, uh, and 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 the greenness of it is, as I said, that's the direction of travel anyway. The greenness of the, the, what is what is operative is not the greenness because that, you know, in terms of the the trajectory that we're looking at, like we're building out slowly, kind of matching our demand, but with ambitious aspirations. When we get to like the high energy power system, it's going to be green. The whole world is going to be green. So right now, what is imperative for African people and everyday people is. How do we just make decisions that power industries, that power, I don't know, agricultural value addition, that just give you something from nothing? Yeah. Um, and Absolutely. actually, I just wanted to really quickly respond to, I, I loved your points on storage and batteries and, and um, absorbing high renewable penetration and what that will look like. Just one, a little bit of texture on that, just to give you a sense of how the starting point that we're looking at in African countries is these are such vulnerable ecosystems. Uh, yeah. You know, in Kenya, so this the Tukana power um, wind power plant is I don't know 340 megawatts came online, and this was already like 15 percent of our uh, generation. You know, just this that's like nothing, and you know, but it's like you know the biggest in Africa. But you know, it was 15 percent, and our entire grid system is struggling to absorb that. We are venting geothermal so that we can take on this wind so that's impacting the sustainability of our geothermal management of our resource, which is like, you know, the lottery that we won. Um, just at 15%, we cannot handle it. And so when you're talking about 60, 70, you yeah. know, you have to kind of really revise down yeah. Yeah. the idea of what a high renewable uh, uh, penetration threshold is in these countries. And again, it's just the ecosystem and I, you know, what is the role of DFIs and your partners in trying to get that right? You know, I was just at the geothermal power plant in Kenya with my colleagues a few years ago, and, you know, it's just this really brilliant guys, but they, they literally have like Nokia brick, bricks, you know, and they're calling the guys up in Turkana, hey, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, this is, we can't absorb, uh, you know, the sophistication with which you need to deploy batteries for all of these different functions yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, forecast demand, or, or even, you know, if we're to have these like green hydrogen or natural peaking plants, um, the sophistication of your markets and your regulatory structure. And like, you know, in Texas, they had this massive disaster because they had this kind of wonky regulatory yeah. Uh, yeah. system where the, the peaking gas became yeah. unbounded and too expensive. And so there's all of this kind of soft and hard 
ecosystem infrastructure that if we are really saying that 2030, 2050, Africans will be consuming much more energy, they will have productive bases, and that will be a green system. That's what we want. That's where we're moving. Like the question is, what are we building today to make that no, possible? I, I, if I may, I mean, you, you've made me think about a couple of things, including something I hadn't thought about it before. I mean, your point about soft infrastructure and power market structures, I, I hadn't previously thought. One of the challenges for the thermal plant may be the following. In the West, we have thermal plant, which has been invested in. It has been running 30 or 40% uh, of the time. Um, even today, individual plants might run 60. We are going to put it on a transition to only run 10% by 2035, but it exists. It already exists. In Africa, if you want a plant which is going to only run 10% of the time in 2035, somebody's got to invest it now and they've got to get a reasonable rate of return. And maybe that rate of return is only going to work unless initially they're running it all the time, right? So this, I mean, maybe this does come back to the balance between base load and flexibility. That Now, the way around it, of course, if this was a rich developed country building a system for the first place, he would say, we are going to encourage you to build that gas turbine and we're going to create a power market structure whereby it makes sense for you to do that, even though we only want you to run it 10% of the time. And this is things like capacity payments as well as energy payments. But your point, Rose, is, wow, that's sophisticated stuff in power market design auctions. And I couldn't agree. I could not agree more with you. These issue of the transmission grids are absolutely fundamental. And, you know, you talked earlier about there are African countries with close to 100% renewables, of course, they are the ones where their renewables are naturally dispatchable. They are, uh, geothermal has a dispatchable nature, hydro, Ethiopia has a dispatchable nature. So the challenge of building these systems with non-dispatchable is gonna be uh, bigger. And, you know, clearly, just given to where Turkana is, unless you have some big grid connections, you're gonna build a whole load of wind turbines there, but you're not going to be able to deliver them. So the, the grid stuff, and I wasn't at all surprised, but was it you said, Nick, Nick earlier, you, you were having investments where the grid is more important than the generation. Yeah. Across average, across the whole of the world, we think that of the total investment required to build zero carbon power systems, 60% will be generation and 40% will be grids. But it doesn't at all surprise me if we hit particular bits of Africa where it will be easily the other way around and, and, and the grid is the big investment need. Mm -hmm. And this is fascinating. I, I feel I could carry on talking about this forever, but um, I'm, I'm conscious that we're almost out of time. And I do want to uh, invite questions from the room and also if we have any online, which I think Mamuna will read those out. So are there any questions in the room? Uh, you want to raise your hand? I, and Olivia has a microphone. Uh, yes, there's one here, uh, one there. OK, so we'll take these two and then we'll come to the online questions. Uh, hello, uh, my name's um, Paddy Carter. I, uh, you, you mentioned that um, <clears throat> Nicholas Stern and Vera Songwe are about to publish something on this, and so maybe you don't want to steal their thunder, but I'd be very interested to hear what you have to say about what you might say, what you might call the ecosystem of institutions that are making concessional finance uh, available for green power uh, around the world. Because to some extent, the cost of capital simply reflects the risks that investors see. Yep, yep. And if you um, use concessional money to yep. try and do something about that, if the supply of concessional money is constrained, it takes a long yep. time to get, and yep. it's only available to a few parties, it can sort of undermine markets as much as it helps. So uh, what are your thoughts there? Should we take several? Mm, yeah, and, we'll take several. There's an overlap. Yeah, and then, so, um, yeah. I'm actually on the Stern Songway yep, yep. high-level expert oh, yeah. group. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> not, I can't. I couldn't say. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah, Sam, lose. Um, I think just to follow up to Paddy's question. So you talked about um, the barriers to lowering the cost of capital and kind of getting to the lower part of that chart that you were talking about that made um, renewables even more attractive. Obviously, we as a DFI are part of the, I guess, the solution to lowering the cost of capital. But what do you want to see from private finance and others to get the um, to the lower cost of capital overall? Okay, why don't we do those questions and then we'll see if there's any online questions. So, um, please. Shall I go through? And then well, look, I mean, I, I did spend uh, a bit of yesterday with Nick Stern uh, going through what is in this you know, Songway Stern uh, report. I mean, at one level, 
the things you need to do to unleash greater quantity, it, it's easy to work out what they are. Well, I mean, the, the big guys here are the MDBs. They are bigger than the, the, the non-MDBs uh, 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 amounts of money, just in sheer terms, uh, of which World Development Bank is, as it happens, the second biggest. The biggest by far is China Development Bank. So what China Development Bank does is hugely important. But if we concentrate on a multilateral uh, rather than a national, um, you know, one could put more capital into them. One could allow them to, you know, take account of callable capital in the size of their balance sheet. You could increase their leverage uh, within the, um, uh, you know, the limits of uh, their AAA rating. Some people could say, why do they absolutely need a AAA rating? Uh, and you can uh, unleash a greater willingness uh, for them to take riskier positions, guarantee positions, which then, to one of your two points, uh, helps unleash the, the, the private sector because the, the, the public sector development bank is taking some risk uh, off the table. And I think all of those should be on the agenda. And I know that uh, Nick and, and Vera Songwe's report is going to quantify just how much quantity we think we need in uh, developing countries. And by the way, I think it's very important to break that down between middle income developing countries and lower income, because I really do think these challenges of capital mobilization are really different between India versus, you know, Chad, which <laughs> you, you might call them both emerging or developing, but you're, you're just dealing with a completely different level of ability to mobilize their own uh, capital. So there are things that one can do on the quantity. I think you know, Nick is very aware, we are very aware that there are a lot of other barriers as well. So we have, I remember we had a session somewhat similar to this with uh, people at the EBRD um, uh, who, you know, operate particularly in places like the Stands, uh, et cetera, but also in some of North Africa. Uh, and, and they were saying, look, it's all very well to give us more balance sheet, but we're sitting there with balance sheet that we'd like to deploy but worried that we don't have clearly bankable projects. Why do we not have bankable projects? Because when you have a renewable energy development, you want to have a 20 year at least managed price or, require, or preferably fixed price guarantee. And that has to be from somebody credit worthy enough to make that a bankable project. And most utilities around Africa are not credit worthy enough because all sorts of things. They've been forced to sell electricity below cost of production. They, you know, they've got losses on their balance sheets, etc. And I think this issue of it isn't just a quantity thing. It's also equipping the MDBs and people like yourselves with the ability to really put effort into the project design and the, and the help with the governments to what they have to do to utility reform to make them bankable. Now, that is partly why we equip MDBs with not just balance sheets, but with the PL flexibility to put the effort into doing that. It doesn't at all surprise me that you had to fly to Nairobi so many times to do what was it, 150 megawatts. 50 megawatts, which you know you'd have thought, you know, in theory, you just sign it. And, and so it, this is not straightforward, and, and we're well aware it's not straightforward. There's a huge number of different things have to happen to unleash this. Yeah. 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 Jump, jump on the utility utility point. Uh, this is so important, and we need uh, NDBs and really doing more to uh, just create new packages to help uh, sort out distressed utilities. And, and sometimes I think what... Um, uh, MDBs and DFIs are doing um, in some sectors are actually uh, worsening the state of utilities. So, for example, um, you know CNI, um, so renewables, putting you you know uh, directly with big yeah. corporates and whatever, which is all well and good and helps us kind of meet our green targets. But when you take high energy consumers off the grid, that just you know really you know makes the utility situation worse. So in Kenya, for example, I think you know. 3,000 out of millions of customers are responsible for 60, 70% of revenues. And so when those companies, which I mean, rightfully the, 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 the grids are unreliable and expensive when they start to go, go off, go off and, and are getting, decline, yeah, and are getting yeah. you know, uh, all of these um, uh, CNI shops are coming in and helping them do their own uh, renewable and power and have all of these great investment packages because that's a bankable 
yeah. bankable project, you have a great optica, which is like a big corporate or industry. Uh, you know, so these are the kind of um, activities in other parts of the ecosystem that are worsening the fate of the utilities. And we cannot do this without utilities that are functioning. They're so important. But, it, but I think it, it does largely change the role of the utilities and in particular probably moves them more towards being sort of wheelers of power, managing the system, managed transmission, distribution, depending on the structure. Yeah, I think, yeah. no, it's true, and I know, I, I hate, you know, and because already there's, there's so much critique, especially in, in mature economies of the utilities, and uh, they're sleeping dinosaurs, and they don't want change, and, you know, they need to get with the program. Um, you know, I will say, I, I do feel bad for utilities on the African continent, because as you said, they have this crazy social mandate to connect every yeah. <laughs> household here and then whenever and that's putting mm -hmm. so much pressure on them and it's yeah. an entirely loss making operation important exactly. but loss making and and you know they can't do this other kind of you know value add um activity yeah, what it's what I really like is to say that there has to be on the government budget a separate budget to do that social aim social, exactly. of 100 percent connection yeah. understanding that it's not going to be an economic problem for the utility but you can see why they migrate I to mean, putting it, it as a requirement it, on the utility in mean, yeah. this country we electrified rural areas post second world war i mean yeah. and it was everyone knew it was not economic but yeah. it was like that was part of we the, did it once there was the system was big enough to big enough the cost. and it was part of a particular point in time yeah. post yeah. you know of yeah. economic yeah. you know and, um, you know this idea of what the power system of the future will look like and I don't I, I don't want to date myself or say that you know we have to do it the traditional way but you know shall we leapfrog power systems in Africa and just not even have utilities I think that that you know I know this is going to be a lot of change and new exciting models but you know we need in, in rich countries you you can't you don't have a power system that's all edges and no center so now that there's a center we're innovating at the edges and so we need a little bit of that center that is so crucial to you know yeah. making the whole system work like we can't have you know this this private finance that's trying to get in it can't because the utility is falling apart and so we still need to really focus on the utilities i think the other thing though we also need is a much greater appetite to the private sector i mean one of the differences between renewable energy and sort of mainstream large generation is that it's uh renewable energy is likely to be much more dominated by private sector pro private sector led projects and public private partnerships rather than these very large government owned uh, gen generation and so i think when you think about the mdb i mean we're obviously a development finance institution that's all we do it's fund the private sector but we see you know in transmission we've talked about there is enormous potential in Africa to privatize more of the transition uh, to bring the private sector into 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 tra into transmission and that's what we're doing in Uganda through uh, Gridworks. And I think that has to be an area of, of real commitment as well. So Absolutely. Um, well, I think we could certainly carry on with this conversation and, and perhaps it will be carrying on in Sham or Sheikh, yeah. no doubt. Um, so I think uh, we're probably out of time. So I apologize if you had questions online, um, uh, uh, not to come to those, but um, perhaps you could join me in thanking uh, our panel for what I think has been a really a, extremely interesting uh, discussion and very enlightening, I think, in many respects. So thank you.